Hello and a good morning from Rockland with TVC22. I'm your host, Thomas Docting. Coming up on today's programme. COVID-19 update as the criteria for third doses is expanded. Updates from the city of Clarence, Rockland. Valoris receives a huge financial boost. Bankley Kill Food Bank Garden expanding in 2022. And the St Albert Cheese Factory takes home awards despite staff shortages. Ahead of the 2022 budget meetings taking place next week in the city of Clarence Rockland, the Municipal Council were discussing changes to daycares on Monday evening. As the city seeks to create a more financially sustainable system, changes are on the horizon with some of the work already underway. During a presentation by Mr Ian Shelley from Blackline Consulting, councillors heard that revenues were getting closer to expenses within the local daycares before the pandemic, but Mr Shelley explained that there was a mismatch between what he called fixed costs such as salaries and benefits and the variable revenues of attendance, which was leaving the system on a financial front pretty exposed. So historically, there's been a lot of flexibility for clients on when they do need to attend and when they don't need to attend. And that increases the revenue variability. And so some of that flexibility has been reduced. And as we understand it, there was an acquisition of a daycare or an inheritance of a daycare rather about a decade ago who brought in with them a lot of those flexibility factors. Many of them, now that you're further on and people are more comfortable with the full operation, um, staff have been able to, re to remove and reduce some of that revenue flexibility. Um, certainly when we, staff had previously done some work around comparing the pay rates to other municipalities in the region. And certainly when you look at the chart, it does appear that the staff at the, at, at the town, at the city are paid at the higher end. Um, there's pay ranges and they certainly overlap in places, but there was no other peer that was selected where the pay ranges were as high. Some overlap, but not as high. So certainly you're, you're paying higher. Um, longer hours were also cited. And so the operation of daycare, I think, went from as early as six to as late as six at one point or even longer. That's been reduced slightly so that now the operations, are, they, you know, they're open less hours and it's better matching the attendance of, of children. I think the experience would have been that through the early hours, there was few children and probably many staff there. And same with later in the day as the children start to be taken out of the, the car. Um, this has led to in turn a, a, a different problem which sort of emphasizes what we're gonna, what we modeled really, which is that to, to cover a day, you need two full-time staff on a seven hour shift and that gets you 14 hours of labor, but only 11 hours of work with the kids. And so that's part of this inefficiency that we modeled into the system, that these, these hours that staff are putting in that are not translating into attendance effectively, which is what is paying off there. Um, enrollment variability is something that has been partially addressed, that there was an, a real flexibility offered that you could pick the days, you could change it week by week. And that, that's an, a really hard example of where you can't even forecast what's coming more than a few weeks ahead, potentially. And with a full-time contingent of staff, you have limited ability to vary your staffing to match what's actually coming in attendance. And that's been partially addressed now. Now parents have to sign up for five days a week. They can't sign up for a you know, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. They have to sign up for a whole week, but there is still flexibility week on week around that. Um, and then matching staff to the number of children that you have somewhere in the region, I think it's 80 to 85 staff and uh, attendance in, 2019, there was somewhere around over a thousand children. Uh, as, a, as I think many of you are probably aware, the ministry mandates a certain ratio of staff to children depending on their age. And so that's part of the planning of daycares is thinking about how many children I have in attendance and how many staff I need to be in the room to meet the provincial ratios. And that's been something that's been done manually historically um, and is a complex affair that there isn't good data for us to go back and analyze how efficient it is but based on the financial data it's clearly had inefficiency built into it in, of not really hitting those ratios one of the things you may have seen in the report if you had an opportunity to go through it is we did look at the various groups and the effect on not matching the ratios so if it was a you know if the ratio was one staff member to eight if you've got one child and one staff member that's obviously highly inefficient as you get to eight the, the efficiency goes up. But when you get to nine, you're back down inefficient again. And this has a direct effect on revenue. So when we looked at the three groups, 
the toddler group, um, because of the ratios, does not come close to making a surplus and will not. There's no operational change you can necessarily make to that that's really going to bring it up to, to achieving a surplus. The other groups, though, vary depending on that, you know, that matching efficiency of making sure the number of kids is hitting the ratio. And you see sort of a cyclic chart that as you hit the ratio, they often get into surplus. And as you come off that ratio, as you have more children, it slips into deficit. So this, even, even though the thought of having more children seems as though it, it's what we need to achieve, it's actually getting close to those ratios and making sure you've got the right number of staff to care for the right number of children. Um, and it does have a huge effect on, the, on that. I would say overall that to date staff have really focused on um, stabilizing the revenue. Their, their, their actions they've taken have largely been around trying to reduce that variability. So we, we've left that. I mean, that's certainly been looked at already. Where our focus went to is how do we, how do we get to a point where we can make the expenses more variable, if you like, that the, the city can have some control over that so that even though you accept some variability in revenue, you've got some levers over variability in expenses. The draft budget for 2022 has now been tabled and ahead of the budget meetings on November the 8th, 9th and 10th next week, residents are invited to provide their comments and questions via the city's website only. It's the only place you can do it and it must be before 3pm on November the 8th. Also on Monday evening, the city of Clarence Rockland approved Mayor Mario Zant's proposal for a committee to discuss the future of Highway 174. The committee will be made up of local administrative staff in what Mayor Zant called an effort to depoliticise the issue. Earlier this week, I spoke with MPP Amanda Simar and asked her what she thought of the move and what she thought the future of the highway should look like. Mm -hmm. Thank you, uh, Thomas. I think the, the question of the 174 uh, Highway 17 is extremely important for residents of Rockland, Hawkesbury, uh, Alfred Plantagenet, Wendover, uh, everybody that's uh, along the river because many, many people use this um, highway to, to get to, to the big city. And, um, and for goods and people to move, uh, it's good for our, our economy. We need, we absolutely need a really safe and efficient um, highway. And for that to happen, we need to upload it back to uh, the province because right now it is a municipal uh, jurisdiction. And um, we know that, you know, when there's too many levels of government involved, um, it's really hard to move the, the project forward. And it's very expensive for the counties to be responsible for this highway. The maintenance, uh, the maintenance and the upgrades and everything that's needed for the highway right now is all municipal responsibility. So it's the municipal taxpayer. We're all the same taxpayer, but we're losing out on, you know, funds that could be used for something else that is more local. And to me, it's the principle. Why are we, uh, our taxpayers are paying for the, the highways in Toronto and all over the province that are all provincial jurisdiction, but nobody else is paying for our highway, right? So there's something there that we need to correct. And this was downloaded in um, the, the Harris years. So it used to be provincial. And my colleague in Orleans, Stephen Blais, uh, just uh, introduced a private member's bill to do exactly that because he, you know, he used to be a municipal councillor in Ottawa and he sees just how much money it costs to, to maintain this highway uh, and that could be used um, elsewhere and for our local uh, projects. And so this is why we're calling for the uploading of this highway. And to me, there's the savings for the municipality and the municipalities, but um, there's also the, the progress of the file for the widening that we would like to see um, happen, which has been, uh, you know, in the, in the works for, and we're, we've been talking about this for decades. So I wasn't even born and we were talking about uh, this, so, and how safe we have to make it. Um, and so it's really important that we move forward with that. And, you know, the federal government committed um, to, to this project, to, to, to doing their share. And then the provincial governments, uh, previous provincial governments have also committed uh, to upgrading this highway. So, you know, it's, it's really now it just needs to be a priority and it needs to be uh, safe for people, especially in the winter. 
and um, avoiding the traffic because we want our economy to, to always grow. And the only way we can do that is we can, if, when we keep people and goods moving. As you say, it's been 40 years of conversation that keeps coming up over and over again. Why do you think that this issue is still ongoing and there's still not been any real concrete moves forward to, to getting it back to the provincial level when I think everyone is in accordance that it, that it should be? Well, actually, the Minister of Transportation, the current Minister of Transportation, said that the, the provincial government would not take it back. So it's that uh, current government's position that they don't want to have that responsibility. So I've written to the premier um, to ask for the highway to be uploaded and they re that they reconsider their position considering, you know, uh, the importance that we have it uh, back uploaded and you know there's 20,000 people who travel on that highway every single day that have to face the traffic the accidents and and everything that makes uh, the morning commute a nightmare uh, and Rockland is growing exponentially and we want to continue to see that growth uh, it's good for everyone and so we we really need to to, to move with the, this highway and we need to make it provincial jurisdiction so that the province can take the leadership uh, and, and invest the funds that are needed to make it safer. Um, and so when we're working with, you know, the two levels of government and then, you know, there's, there's not money put aside uh, by the municipal government, there's a, a few funds committed by the provincial government. It's just, it needs to be a provincial responsibility and we take leadership on this project and we just get it done. Obviously, to get it back up to a level of government, we cannot remove politicians because it is a political matter. But what do you make of this move of creating a committee that's made up of administrative staff rather than transient politicians, whether you're in for one term, two term or three? At the end of the day, people pop in and out. So what do you make of this move by the mayor of Rockland to create a committee that is completely made up of essentially non-political people to find the best solution for the growth, as you mentioned, of Clarence Rockland? Mm -hmm. I spoke with uh, Mario Zant uh, just last week about this, and I think, you know, we always welcome uh, the, the, the work of independent experts, right, and the professionals, because I was a municipal councillor before uh, being elected. I was a municipal councillor in Russell, and I know, you know, the planners and the people that it's their expertise they know what's best um, and we've done studies in the past about this highway and you know we need to get it um, widened and to make it safer and more efficient um, but we always welcome you know any uh, suggestions any recommendations anything that comes out of that committee for sure uh, this is good information right and it's always a good idea to remove the politicians as much as I want to be uh, involved in every single part of, of the process is usually because we're so passionate. Um, it's really important to respect and, and to uh, appreciate uh, the work of the experts. So I'm looking forward to see uh, what comes out of that. But I think the reality, um, there, there's 20,000 people traveling on this highway uh, every day. And, you know, even when people say, oh, well, now we work virtually, there's less of a need. Well, in 2007, when the provincial government under Dalton McGinty committed $40 million, um, there were 11,000 traveling then, and then it was an urgent uh, matter. It was very important that we do something with, with the Highway 174. So there were 11,000 people then in 2007. Now there's 20,000. So even if 9,000 are working remotely now, um, there still is the need. So according to what the, the studies had shown uh, at the time. So, um, so I think it's always worth looking at and um, we always need to be up to date. So no matter what, I think before we move forward with uh, an actual project, we will um, have those studies done um, again. Um, I think because there's so much money involved, it's a quite a, a few hundred million dollar project. Um, but you know, at the end of the day, we need to get moving on this project. And uh, just finally on, on this topic, MPP Sima, um, what do you really think it will take to convince either the current government that's in now, whether they're re-elected next year or whether there's a change in government to take this seriously? As you mentioned, they don't think, you, you mentioned that the Ministry of Transportation doesn't feel like it is something that should be taken up to the provincial level. So what would it take from people on the ground, whether it be committees or politicians such as yourself, to really make people take a look at this and take this seriously down in Toronto? I think just looking at the facts, 
right? Looking at the number of people that are using this, what it looks like in the morning. And I, I, I can bet you, you take anybody traveling on that route in the morning and uh, they can explain, you know, what they're going through. And, you know, I've seen uh, uh, people talk about they're from Hawkesbury and they leave home, you know, at the the hours like 4, 4 a.m. just to get uh, to work in time. And so uh, you need to look at what people are going through, how it's affecting their life. And also, if you want to have the economic um, argument to keep people and goods moving and to have businesses want to come uh, and establish themselves in the area, we already do have a lot of interest and that's wonderful. But think of how much more we could get if we just had that fluidity, you know, that that movement um, and that ease of, you know, traveling, uh, that would be just huge. And so governments recognize that usually um, that it's good for the economy. And, you know, we hear the Ford government all the time saying they're all for highways and getting people moving. I've seen a million ads on TV. So let's see if uh, their actions uh, match the words. So. MPP Sima there talking about the future of Highway 174. Uh, during that interview as well, we had an opportunity in French to discuss uh, what MPP Sima had spoken about in the Parliament down in Toronto on the upgrading and renewing of the law of French services as well. Uh, since then, there has been a recent development in the sense that um, Ms. Caroline Mulroney, uh, Minister Caroline Mulroney for French Francophone Affairs, have tabled with the Conservative Party, have tabled their new law on French services as well. If you'd like to hear what MPP Sima had to say on the subject, you can go and find that interview obviously in French French on our YouTube channel and on our Facebook page. Now, she was speaking of roads there, let's look at some roads closer here. After what feels like an eternity, Industrial Street is now open to traffic once more. The area does still remain a construction zone, so drivers are asked to adhere to speed limits in place and the entrance to the Clarence Rockland Arena will remain closed for the time being. There is also no pedestrian access to Edward Street at the moment, as between Albert Street and County Road 17, the sidewalk is closed whilst work is undertaken to reconstruct said sidewalk. The work started on the 1st of November and is set to be completed on the 15th. Now, let's take a look at the COVID-19 situation in our region. At the time of recording, there were six active cases in the United Counties of Prescott Russell, of which none, absolutely none, zero, are in the city of Clarence Rockland. Fantastic news right there. The seven day rolling average is now down as low as 3.3 and the vaccination rates continue to rise with 91.3% of the percent of the EOHU population having received one dose and 87.5% having received both. The Eastern Ontario Health Unit also announced this week that they are expanding the eligibility criteria for the third dose of the COVID-19 vaccine. So far, 3,651 third doses have been administered. And now residents who have received their second dose over six months ago in the following categories can get their third shot too. This includes Indigenous populations on or off reserve and their household members aged 18 and over. Healthcare workers designated individual caregivers in congregate settings, and individuals who receive two doses of the AstraZeneca vaccine or one dose of the Janssen one. The OHU have stressed that although the third dose is recommended, it is neither urgent nor is it mandatory. Individuals with two doses will still be considered fully vaccinated, but a third dose is said to improve the immune response as well as help preventing infections. The cheese factory in Saint Albert is not only an iconic local institution with a history dating well over 100 years at this point, but they're also an award-winning cooperative as they have taken home five awards, including a first place in this year's British Empire Cheese Show. Despite the success, getting staff is proving to be difficult, but according to their general manager, Mr. Eric Lafontaine, this is an issue that predates the pandemic. Well, I believe that the the crisis itself of labor has started before the COVID, before the pandemic. And since then, it's slowed down a bit. But since that, uh, we're almost, uh, well, we're getting out of the crisis, uh, the labor shortage getting more and more intense. And 
before we used to have resume when we'd have the job openings, but now it's really rare that we have some. And even though that we increase salaries over the last few years, uh, everywhere we're doing a salary increase and now we're having a hard time finding workers. And unfortunately, that's creating that we need to short some customer or stop certain products or them skew because we don't have the labor force. And the, the, the issue also is we're growing like crazy. Um, the cheese factory is, is growing since the last couple of years. And it's affecting that there's a labor shortage. And even though the, the starting salary is at $20 in the, in the plant at the uh, working in production and go and increase for up to two, uh, well, up to $25 after a few months and the, the, the people doing the job a, with premiums and everything, we, we, it, it's tough to get people. We don't have, we, we have a hard time finding employees uh, uh, sending their resume. So it's a crisis that it's affecting everyone in Canada, but we feel it maybe a bit more in rural Ontario. So that's where we are right now. And we know it's going to be there for a while. And we're just hoping that uh, we're going to find a lot of solution to, uh, to solve that issue. And speaking of that, what are what could be some of these solutions? As you mentioned, you're you're part of a competitive, growing business as well. You've got openings. You're providing a competitive salary as well, which is actually higher than a lot of other sectors are even offering. So, what are, what could be some of these solutions? Because it feels like you're doing a lot already. Well, my HR team are really busy and doing a lot of stuff, good stuff, uh, of attracting people. But one of the challenge also that we have is. Um, there is no uh, place to live in the, the rural Ontario. It's uh, there is no, not a lot of apartments to rent, and there's not a lot of house uh, for sale. So that being said, it's a challenge uh, to attract people. Even though we, we there's a the housing uh, shortage in the region, uh, so we're working on different uh, fronts to make sure that in the future we're gonna have a housing solution for all the people that are coming to work uh, in the uh, at the cheese factory. Because the issue is not only I, yes, we attract a lot of people from Eastern Ontario, but sometimes we need some specialized workers that there are some time in Calgary in the north of Ontario, they could come from Toronto, it doesn't matter. But for them finding a space to, to live, it's really tough. Um, so we need to work on that uh, front too. Yeah, affordable housing was a big topic during the federal election, but a lot of the candidates did sort of deflect it over to the municipal, uh, so pardon me, to the provincial representation. We've got the provincial elections next year. What are you hoping to see from the next person that comes in to represent Glengarry Prescott Russell? Well, I, I believe that it's uh, it to work with uh, the different region, the rural region, the municipality, to make it uh, easier and faster to have some uh, some housing. So it doesn't matter if it's uh, let's say for like for us what we what we need is uh, we don't need the houses of uh, three thousand square feet. We need some housing uh, that's going to be um, I'll say that some temporary housing uh, for workers that are coming in the region and after that they find an apartment or they find a house. But right now there's none. There's so it's a main challenge for and, and we're not the only one in the. <laughs> Where everyone uh, in the region is uh, looking for apartments or for houses. And uh, just finally, Mr. Lafontaine, uh, we, we've heard that there's probably going to be uh, an increase in um, gate milk prices in the new year. You mentioning there, obviously, you're struggling to get people to come and fill jobs, and that will uh, that will massively be affecting the way in which the cheese factory is trying to expand already. So, what kind of effects do you think that all of these factors are going to have on on 2022 for the fromagerie in Saint Albert? Well, for 2022, we're still really optimistic. Yes, we know there's a milk price increase uh, going on, but everything is going uh, is increasing. The inflation, it's unbelievable uh, everywhere. Yes, there's a milk price increase of 8.4% uh, that has been announced by the CDC, the Canadian Dairy Commission, but also all the other increases we're getting, doesn't matter if it's corrugated, it's plastic, it's chemicals, uh, it's unbelievable. It's, it's coming from all fronts. So that being said, uh, it's going to be 2022 is going to be a challenging year, but we've been in the business for 127 years. So we're still looking at the future uh, that there's a potential for growth and uh, it's going to be tough. But hey, it's in 127 years, we saw a lot of things. <laughs> And Mr. Lafontaine, uh, the, the final thing for me to really say is if there's anyone watching whose interest has been piqued by the kind of working environment and uh, benefits that you can get from working with the Cheese Factory, how could they get in touch to apply? 
Well, it's easy. Go on the website, stalbertcheese.com. Uh, there is a spudware for job openings, and the j descriptions are there, and my HR team will be uh, really happy to give you give the people a call and having an interviews and things like that. And for us, it's not only salaries at the cheese plant. It's really, it's a family. It's, um, yes, we're getting a bigger company than before, but that being uh, said, we're still having, um, it's like a big family. It's, uh, we have fun, uh, we laugh. Yes, we need to work, we need to work hard, but we need to have fun also because we're passing uh, 40 hours a week there. So we need to have fun for sure. Mr. Eric Lafontaine there here to uh, discuss some of the job openings ongoing at the moment at the St. Albert Cheese Factory. So you heard a lot of information there and maybe that has piqued your interest. Uh, the Vankley Kill Food Bank Garden Programme is one of the many organisations in the region that have received a fine, substantial financial boost thanks to the Volunteers Prescott Russell Community Innovation Grant Programme. A grant of $12,000 has allowed the Garden Programme to extend its work into the fall of 2021 and has already been very successful in teaching people the value as well as how to grow your own food. I think food insecurity is is a huge issue um, for most families. The, the, the divide between the haves and the have nots is only getting greater. And as much as a food bank, we are able to provide our clients with groceries. It's not in the abundance perhaps that they would like or the abundance that they could acquire by growing their own food. So it just seemed the next logical step was to let's, let's get them growing and, and see what they can uh, accomplish for themselves. So what's some of this money going to go towards to be able to help the next growing season? And when do you, uh, when do you expect to start again in the new year? So the brunt of the, right now we've uh, had four raised beds installed at the uh, Grand Barn Community Garden to allow those people, uh, those of our clients with mobility issues who found going down to ground level too difficult. So now we have, they're two feet high, so there's no getting down on your knees. Uh, in our tool lending library, we will be purchasing stools and, and kneeling pads for them to utilize so that they don't have to get down at ground level. So that was th that's our first part of the project that's uh, that's been completed and we're really excited about that. We're going to be planting garlic in one of those raised beds this week so that we'll have garlic in the early spring, um, but also getting the beds ready for uh, for, for the winter's dormancy with, with compost and mulch so that uh, we have great growing soil for next year. And uh, speaking a little bit more of the Van Cleek Hill um, Food Bank to begin with, as an organisation, is it just uh, what, how many people do you represent? How many people do you actually need to help out every year? What is the situation actually like for you? So the, the Food Bank and its sister Thrift Store are part of uh, the, the Cafe Registered Charity. Um, we've seen almost, uh, a, a, our clientele has almost tripled since 2019. Uh, and we service um, between 25 and, and 30 families a month. Well, which again, is, staggering need. Yeah, yeah sta huge, staggering need for food poverty from, in the region. Yeah, huge increase from, we were serving nine, nine families a month in 2019. So, I mean, it's, it's well, that was the increase. Absolutely. Absolutely. Sorry. That was going to be my next question. No, no, it's quite all right. That was literally my next question. I was wondering how, how it sort of compared year on year and how this trying year, which I feel like is this reoccurring topic in every conversation and interview I have at the moment, but we can't shy away from it. It has, it has played such a big part on all of our lives. So how, how did you find, how have you found in terms of the food bank element comparing year on year when we take the pandemic into consideration? And how much do you think this program is then being able to sort of expand? Because you're outside as well so surely in the even in the harder yeah. bits of the pandemic you're still able to keep going absolutely and and i think that's um an undervalued part of the program is that it provides mental health uh benefits for our clients who are um uh, at, at part of the at-risk population and it allows them to socialize um in a safe space so our garden beds are all uh, five to 10 feet apart so people can work in their beds and interact with their neighbors, but never get within that two meters of social distancing. So I, th I think that's a real benefit for, um, 
for our clientele on top of being able to produce their own food. Yeah, you mentioned some things being added next year, such as the, the raised beds, especially for people maybe with mobility issues. And tell me yes. what I'll tell you right now. Like when I saw that, I thought it was fantastic. I mean, I, a young, sprightly man myself, but I remember having to get down on my hands and knees with my nan when I was helping her out in the garden. And it was it was a nightmare then uh, for myself as well. Uh, so that's I guess that's one of the lessons. But I wanted to ask you as well, Jane, about some of maybe the other lessons that you learned from this pilot year and the things you hope to improve upon next. Next year. So the, our, our other main uh, lesson that we learned was that our clientele doesn't necessarily have the, the implements necessary to succeed. So some clientele had tomato steaks, others did not. So um, we're implementing a tool lending library with the innovation grant. We'll, we're going to install a, uh, a shed and we will have, you know, trowels and rakes and shovels and lattice for squash and tomato cages and everything that they would need to, um, to succeed in their gardening attempts. Uh, as well, uh, part of our funding is to have a workshop and we're going to just talk about the basics of, of gardening. We had one client who did not realize that bean plants will produce all season. So she harvested her first um, harvest of beans and then yanked out the plant, not realizing it would continue to propagate. So it's just, it, 2021 was a learning curve and now we're, we're getting ready to get this thing rolling in 2022. Yeah, it's fun. Not only is it a great activity, as you say, with mental health and social benefits, it helps out on the food bank diet side of things because you're producing food. It gives a better understanding and value of food as well. But the educational tool as well, as you say, can't be undermined in the slightest. Uh, we, you spoke a little bit earlier about some of the 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 beds that were kind of donated as you purchased one, one was given to you. Uh, I mean, I wanted to ask how important is the Foodland Bank League Hill, like the partnership you have, as well as the other local partnerships that help support the Foodland, how important are they to you? You know, start with Foodland Bank League Hill has been an invaluable partner for the food bank. With its, whether it's donating seeds to our, our food bank garden, or just they they have an, an endless fundraiser of, of brown bags that people can purchase on site that have goods, non-perishable goods in them that the food bank uses on a regular basis. But they have been an invaluable partner in providing us with seeds. We just received a huge donation of seeds for 2022. Uh, food activated, donated, you know, hundreds of, of seedlings, uh, tomatoes and peppers and leeks and all cabbage and endless, endless seedlings for our clients. Um, the Champlain Library, again, was amazing in donating lettuce and cucumbers and radish seeds. It, it really, we were overwhelmed by the community support for this endeavor. Uh, and we speak then, uh, obviously, the main reason why we come to speak today as well is that uh, community innovation grant program and that $12,000. How important has that been as well, that, that financial support from a, a county organization essentially trying to highlight businesses and organizations such as yourself doing such great work? that that is uh, we were thrilled when we re we uh, we received that we had uh, received notification that we had received the grant uh, i don't we would have continued into 2022 on a much smaller scale uh definitely without the raised beds for the accessibility for our clients um but this just it's like a dream come true not only do we we get to have accessible beds for our clients we get to provide them with the necessary tools to succeed and we are able to expand the number of beds that we can offer to our clients next year. So it really is the best of all worlds for us to receive this grant. Well, fantastic, Jane, I can tell you, I'll have to be popping down once the year. Yeah. I'm not gonna lie, you, you might be planting the garlic, I'm not gonna come see it until the snow is gone, but I would love to pop down and see yeah. the, the garden and the program you've got going on in Absolutely. the new year as well. Uh, and Jane, I think just before we go, I'd just like to give you the, the platform here. So if people are in need, if people want to get in touch, what's the best way they can get in touch with you? Uh, we're on all social media, Facebook and Instagram through at Vankley Kill Food Bank, or they're welcome to give us a call the old fashioned way at 
Fantastic, Jane Fan. Thank you so much for speaking with us today and for sharing a little insight there about the program you've got going on. And as I mentioned, uh, I would love to come see you guys in the new year. And in the meantime, what I'm going to be doing is going home and making some leek and potato soup because I think the weather calls for it and you got me nice and hungry talking about those leeks then. Thank you, Jane. Thanks so much. Great conversation there with Jane Panty and they have a fantastic group and a fantastic project ongoing at the Van Cleek Hill Food Bank. So if you get an opportunity to check it out, donate, help out, whether it's and Van Cleek Hill, or obviously here, we will be obviously speaking to Nicole Gold and our local food bank here soon as well, as they do some fantastic and much needed work as we approach the festive period. Now, uh, over $200,000, a life-changing amount, has been raised for Valorous Prescott Russell in 2021, thanks to the Catch the Ace Lottery that's organized by the Kin Club of Russell. Earlier this week, I had the chance to speak to Mr. Doug Anthony of the Kin Club and Ms. Carola, Carol Granata, Valoris's Communities That Care coordinator, about why Valoris was chosen and how this enormous amount of money will be put to use. Catch the Ace is a progressive lottery. We start with the 52 cards of a playing deck, mix them up really well, put them in envelopes, seal them, mix the envelopes up again, number them 1 to 52. So each week we sell tickets. Tickets are sold either online, you can go to our website www.kinclubrussell.ca or you can buy them in a number of retail stores. Every week we do a draw, a physical draw where we draw one winner and that winner wins 20% of what we sold for that week. So like I advised earlier, the last week the weekly winner won $51,000 just for that weekly win, not including the jackpot. Each week as well the one winner gets to open one envelope, and that envelope only belongs to him or her, not everybody else. A lot of people are confused on that. They open the envelope. If the ace of spades in it, then they win the jackpot. The jackpot goes up 30% of what we sell each week, so it goes up fairly quickly. The other half, the other 50%, so the 1.1 million that we had left, mm -hmm. after expenses goes directly to the charities. And we don't keep a cent. We don't take any admin fee. We just give 100% back to the community, and we gave uh, almost $972,000 back to our six charities. Fantastic, and yeah, how, how did you decide to pick Valoris as one of those charities? I mean, like, we all, we all I know was lucky they did. locally, but uh, yeah, how, how was, what was the decision process? We, we knew Carol from before, and it's funny because when we first started Catch the East, we were begging people to come on board, and we, we asked them to come out. We had sessions, nobody showed up. But in this case, we had a number of applications, and one of them was Valoris. And we looked at it, and the more we looked into Valoris, the more we fell in love with it. I'm a past RCMP officer, so I know the value of what these organizations do for the community, do for families, and do for children. It was a no-brainer. And then the other part of the assessment was, will they be able to work and go out? This is probably one of the best workers we've ever had. She just busted her butt selling tickets and pushing them. Uh, it was a great partnership. That's right. And uh, Carol, like talking to you here, the, the amount of money raised over $200,000 for you is what a lot of people in their personal lives would consider a life changing amount of money. Now, for an organization, obviously, expenses are very different, but still, how, how much does that money mean to you guys to be able to keep your programs going? It, it means so much because, like our program, CTC Communities That Care, that's exactly what it is. It's a program to help our teens and our children in our community to develop into the best of themselves. So we need to, to promote leadership, positive thinking. Uh, we have to, to really help all these kids to, to be able to, to function. And, and like it's a prevention program, right? So we need to buy programs uh, that are tested and validated. And these programs are expensive. And uh, Valeris is my employer, but CTC is a program that Valeris purchased. And for the last 15 years, we've been running that program with different uh, approaches all through Prescott Russell. I'm just lucky to have the region in, in Russell, but we also have the one in Rockland. We also have the one in Oxbury. So we need to raise funds to be able to buy these programs because, again, we need the community to be served in the way that they need. Mental health, as we know, <coughs> is a, a big thing. Anxiety is a big thing. So those are our main programs that we will purchase, that we already have some, but we need to innovate and get 
even better ones. Ah, so you speak about mental health, anxiety, depression, all these kinds of stuff. And that's even more important now, surely, for you in the light of the pandemic. It sure is. Like uh, teenagers were stuck at home, like especially the teen groups, I'd say like 12 to 16 year old. That group was like, they, they need their friends. They, they love their families. And it did help. A lot of the kids told us that they, they, they participated more in their, in their own family, but they needed their friends and they need their, their peers to be able to learn from. So we weren't able to, to, to do that for them at that time. Virtually we did, but it wasn't the same thing. What are some of the uh, specific programs that you can offer to people in the region to be able to help them with maybe some of the issues that they're struggling well, with? Well, we have uh, one that we use uh, right now. It's called uh, Friends. The Friends group is really a program geared to the younger kids, so I'd say 11 to 12-year-olds, uh, and that's really geared to anxiety. So it's a small group, so we can also go into the schools and offer the program. Um, we used to be able to do that before the pandemic. Hopefully we'll be able to start again, but we are offering after school now. So now, basically, every two, three nights a week, if not more, we are offering these programs so kids can come to Valerius and get the same help that they would probably get in school, but now they can't. Um, all kids of, in the community are accepted. Our program is not just for kids that are receiving help from Valerius. It's for all kids and teenagers in the communities. They don't need to, to necessarily uh, um, need help anywhere else. This is... It's for everyone. Yeah, and uh, Doug, obviously, Valerius, <coughs> the work that they're doing there, as Carol just explained really comprehensively, is so important. But they're one of many charities and organizations that the King Club do help out as well. So can you tell us about, a little bit about the, uh, the mission statement and the reason behind why uh, the King Club wants to get so involved like that in the community? Thank you. Our, our mission statement is serving the community's greatest need. And that entails what is best for the community, not what's best for us, not what's best for a certain, it's what's best for the entire community. And it makes it really easy to give back to such worthwhile uh, entities such as Valor's Foundation. And when we pick our charities, we're very careful how we do it, that they represent what the community needs and how is it going to improve. How can we make the Township of Russell, which is the third best place to live in Canada, how can we make it number one? And we, we work hard to give back, and we really take a lot of stock in strategic planning and deciding which charities we have to support. They're all worthwhile. It's really tough saying no to a lot of them, but it's a lot more fun saying yes. <laughs> I see, and like whether it's an organization that would like your help, or simply a volunteer that wants to be able to help propel King Club of Russell to be able to make them continue to allow you to do more work. How can people get in touch and get involved with you? Oh, I love that question. We're very proud. We have a waiting list of people wanting to join. Get a hold of us at uh, kinclubofrussell at gmail.com or get a hold of us on our website, www.kinclubofrussell.ca. We are really different in that when we take on volunteers, we look at transactional volunteers. You don't have to go to meetings. You don't have to spend a lot of money. If you just want to work one project or two, whether it's Pope Masters or galas or with their ABBA concert coming up, things like that, get a hold of us and we can certainly use you somehow. But uh, it's a great organization, develops our leaders, but more importantly, it helps us give back to the great community that we live in. Fantastic. And we touch on uh, volunteers there, obviously, because it has been such a hard time for people to implicate themselves over the last 18 months. But hopefully, people are getting more involved. So, right back to you there, Carol. How can people get involved with helping support Valerius's Foundation, but also people who might need your support as well? How can they reach out? Exactly. The, the easiest way, obviously, they can go look at our website, uh, Valerius of Prescott Russell, but the, the 1 800 number. So, 1 800 6756 that number is, they can call any time of the day. Uh, it's, it's obviously during work hours, but we do have a system too that if there's an emergency, they will, they're answering 24-7. Uh, that's the best way, and then they can be de redirected at the areas that they need or want to discuss more. There is some great work occurring in the community in Prescott Russell, isn't there? Well, that's it for your news roundup this week. As ever, if there's a story within the community that you think needs some more light shined on it, then you can reach out to us. 
You can get in touch by calling the station at the number that's about to appear below, or you can email me at nouvelle with an S at tvc22.ca. And remember, next Thursday is Remembrance Day. There will be a small event organized in Clarence Rockland, as usual, at the Cenotaph. Uh, nothing big, a little bit similar to what it was last year as we're still trying to adhere so to some of the COVID restrictions going on, but members of the public are invited to come and witness it from the sidewalk. And as well, it's the centenary of the poppy campaign in Canada as well. So if you want to make sure you go get yourself your poppy, you can contact the local Legion. Just speak to Don Ferreira and uh, I'm sure they'll be able to get one for you. And for now, it's good morning from me. It's of course good morning from the team and we'll see you next weekend. Goodbye.